Welcome to LiveWire. Today we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence. I'm Lachlan McGregor. I'm a portfolio manager at Alfinity Investment Management. I'm joined today by Nikki Skavak. Uh, Nikki's a, a co-founder and partner at uh, Blackbird Ventures and by Andrew Charlton, who is a director of Alpha Beta. Today with, with artificial intelligence, everyone talks about this, but, uh, but it would be great to just um, narrow in on what we actually mean by artificial intelligence, maybe just in one sentence, uh, if each of you could just describe what, what it means to you. Nikki. I think art artificial intelligence is letting uh, computers spot patterns uh, in information or interpreting uh, images and videos like a, like a human would in classifying objects and, and so on. So I think the definition for me is uh, where a computer can process images and videos like um, it processes text uh, today. Yeah, artificial intelligence is machines thinking in the way that humans do. Uh, machines going from doing computation or calculation to doing problem solving and even learning. Mm. That's the essence of artificial intelligence. So it's been around for so long. Why, why has it accelerated in the last few years? What, uh, it was a strange uh, uh, coincidence, but people who play computer games um, uh, have uh, very expensive graphics cards. So if you remember, if you buy a computer, um, uh, if you remember uh, back in 10 or 12 years ago, you would buy a, a computer with a, a CPU, but you might also upgrade your graphics card. And, and the graphics card contains these special kinds of processors called GPUs, which let um, computers calculate lots of numbers in parallel um, to simplify mm -hmm. it dramatically. And what happened was these graphics cards that were used by people playing computer games um, turned out to be really good at running uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. And so um, uh, by virtue of uh, people spending lots of money on graphics cards, those got cheaper. Um, those got cheaper and cheaper, such that artificial intelligence uh, folks started using them and they got even more cheaper. And so the, the company um, that's leading the charge in that respect is uh, NVIDIA, which mm. started off for, for these kind of hardcore computer gamers, but now is uh, you know, forging their way in autonomous vehicles or uh, you know, more general purpose uh, AI processes uh, in data centers or, or cloud services. And so um, that getting really, really cheap. Uh, and then just the software world um, has turned in from a sort of proprietary, uh, you know, you think Oracle, IBM world of the 80s, where now lots of software um, is freely available and open source and that being so widely available that people can just go and experiment. They don't need permission to start. They don't need money to start. And then, um, you know, they, they start to make the breakthroughs. And again, the, the sort of world moves forward. So many people try and put a, a size on the, on the industry or any industry they analyze. I've seen IDC forecasts that say that the industry currently is about $12 billion and that it's going to grow to $58 billion. I mean, it's anyone's guess. But Andrew, perhaps if you can talk about how you think about the sort of size and impact of artificial intelligence on the, on the world. Sure. Well, 58 billion is still pretty tiny in the scheme of a, <clears throat> a massive economy. But mm. uh, the role of artificial intelligence is to transform every industry. You know, we're already seeing artificial intelligence having uh, a massive impact in digital industries, um, but it's also got a huge role in traditional in industries as well, uh, becoming a really core part of the way that those businesses uh, operate. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence, um, as Nikki was saying, is exploding at the moment. Uh, it's, we have um, a really rapid increase in data availability, mm -hmm. a really rapid increase in processing ability, particularly parallel processing, plus uh, much better algorithms. And the three of those things are coming together to create an explosion. And you know, mm -hmm. how fast it moves, I think, um, will be a function of how fast we adopt it. The current, the whole tech spending globally is about four trillion. So fifty-eight billion does seem like a, a drop in the ocean <laughs> compared to that. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot bigger in the media at the moment than it is in real life. But I think that's about to flip. Yes, I think market size is also an interesting um, uh, uh, area in that where technology companies were happy to sell technology, technology companies have actually become much more ambitious and want to be that company. So whether uh, mm -hmm. You know, Uber 20 years ago would have sold its mobile software to taxi operators all around the world and you would have had mm -hmm. uh, the taxi operators um, spend an X amount of money on um, the software that Uber might have provided them. Um, instead, what happened was Uber decided to be the service to take the responsibility for the consumer experience and to 
own all of the consumer relationships and to be the business. And so mm -hmm. um, there's also the question of um, usually uh, how the world changes is that there's these uh, big waves of change. Um, and when there's a wave of change, it kind of opens up a little window where startups can create big businesses, um, uh, other technology companies or other companies can um, uh, use that window to reinvent themselves and to mm -hmm. enter new markets and, and so on and so forth. And so um, even uh, uh, perhaps uh, as technology companies have become much more ambitious and become much less likely to say, oh, why don't I uh, sell this software to financial services or why don't I sell this technology to whatever industry it's uh, let's become an automotive manufacturer, let's become a bank, let's become, mm -hmm. um, which again, the spending there um, is a little more nuanced because it's a company transformation. It's not, you know, uh, dollars changing hands between a technology company and a um, traditional company. One thing I think that's often underappreciated is that we're already using this technology in our, in our daily life. Uh, maybe if each of you could give an example of, uh, of something that we're using currently that, that involves artificial intelligence. Well, we, you know, we all have artificial intelligence in our in our pocket. You know, mm -hmm. Siri or Siri's Microsoft sister Cortana. You know, these are mm -hmm. artificial in, uh, artificial uh, intelligence products. Um, the products that enable us to do um, uh, face recognition every time we turn on Netflix and get uh, suggestions for what to watch. That's that's mm -hmm. a machine doing problem solving and serving us an answer. I heard a statistic that Netflix, 80% of the viewing time on Netflix is from things that are served up to people under the recommendation engine rather than from the search. So, you know, it's, it's core to that business's proposition. Absolutely. And, and, you know, really interesting to see people's preferences reinforced in a way that, you know, in previous generations they might, they might mm -hmm. not have been. And what that does to our, to our viewing habits is, I think, really fascinating as well. And Nikki, what's your favourite example? Uh, it's a little bit uh, not in our daily lives at the moment, but I think you know the biggest expression of AI will actually be cars driving themselves, and um, mm -hmm. what that kind of world that that facilitates. You know whether it is people no longer owning cars, uh, whether you know I think 40% of LA um, is associated with parking, so car parks or parking lanes or driveways and garages, and what do you do with all of that real estate? Mm -hmm. um, what do you do with car insurance when the cars don't crash? Uh, you know, it just has such a uh, domino effect on how cities work that I think, um, you know, at least in my mind, um, uh, that will have the biggest impact on our society. Yeah, I think that I think that example is is fascinating. You know, we spent we spent the last forty years trying to build as many roads as we can to mm -hmm. end, end congestion. You know, that relies on us. Um, uh, solving for humans driving cars at you know 10, 15 metres apart. In an AI world, those cars mm. could be three times closer to each other. Mm. And that means you need three times less uh, road area. So you know, in the future, we might have the problem of too many rather than too few roads. Um, and the, the consequences of this is just so um, uh, extensive across a range of different infrastructure, social, health, education outcomes. It's interesting how it transforms both our lives and, and also all of these industries. You know, just as you say, automotive, um, autonomous driving will transform not just the automotive industry, but will transform so many other industries around that. You know, healthcare, if there's less accidents, what, mm. less people in hospital, if there's, there's no insurance needed or it's, uh, it's done at a central level, perhaps Volvo takes out an insurance policy for the, for the whole group. Um, one of my favourite examples of how this is going to change the, the world in the future is actually uh, generative um, design tools. So it's actually possible now to, to get a computer to design a new product. You just give it the constraints. You say, okay, um, I, I, want, I want you to optimise for this and that and, and get it to iterate and it will actually come up with a, a whole new design of something. Uh, an aerial drone chassis, chassis I saw an example of and you just give it, you say, okay, you've, you've got a drone, so it's got four propeller spots. You want it to be lightweight, aerodynamic, strong, and just see it, see it iterate. And you can actually watch this on, online and see, see all the different um, versions of this. And then when it, the final version that, that came out um, is just like a, a, a squirrel's pelvis, um, which, you know, the, the example being this is just evolution, right? This, yeah. is, this is computers iterating in an evolutionary way to come up with a better design than any human actually could and uh, you know, these designs are, are, look very odd but they're not, they're not something we would think naturally. I, anything else? You're, you're at the forefront of the next wave of things that are going on. What, what mm. do you see coming next in terms of transformation? I think it's interesting uh, like technology in general has caused massive deflation in the prices of 
so many industries. Um, I mean, you just think about the mobile phone being in your pocket and all of the available services and how much you, you pay for that um, per month. But there's been these uh, kind of strands of industries that have not been subject to that technology deflation. So mm -hmm. um, healthcare being uh, an obvious one, um, the construction industries had no productivity gains in 100 years or something like that. And so there's these sort of outlier uh, industries that have kept on high inflation. Um, and I think particularly with AI, it has the ability um, obviously in healthcare to um, uh, do the job of a very highly paid person um, essentially for free, um, you know, to diagnose with greater accuracy cancers mm -hmm. of all types way earlier than humans are able mm -hmm. to um, detect and, and, you know, making healthcare a $10 a month product, not a, you know, four or $500 a month um, product. Uh, and also AI um, is almost, um, allows computers to solve physical problems. So if you think about computers at the moment, it's very information processing heavy, it's virtual problems, it's um, uh, you know, banking, financial services, it's transformed those industries. It hasn't, computing hasn't transformed the construction industry, but now with AI, it essentially allows uh, robots to um, interact with the physical world. So it allows computers to solve physical problems rather than just virtual problems. So I think um, you look at the economy and you look at the strands of the industries that just have kept on going up mm -hmm. in price, um, I think you'll start to see those uh, moderate and then come way down in price like healthcare and like construction. Andrew, you've, you've done a lot of work for some of these, these big companies. What, what do you see coming in the future? Look, I think that's right. Um, I think there is a potential to transform industries like healthcare, but I think there's also a huge opportunity to transform the way we live. I mean, to take the healthcare example, you know, not only um, can we have artificial intelligence solving healthcare problems, you know, uh, reading uh, x-rays and other images. Um, you've got the capacity for artificial intelligence to prevent us from getting sick in the first place. Mm. You know, uh, the combination of artificial intelligence and the internet of things, uh, tracking our, our, our personal data, uh, looking at what's in our fridge, uh, encouraging us to eat better, uh, controlling the kind of steps we do in the day, um, communicating with our healthcare professionals, tying that back to a range of different types of information from our family and family history, and identifying problems before they emerge rather than after they emerge. Uh, and uh, that's a pervasive impact on the way that we live and the way that our healthcare sector will, will operate that goes beyond productivity into different models of delivery. And which, which companies would you say are at the forefront of this globally? You know, well, the, the, the big famous ones are obviously um, right up there at the forefront. You know, Google's made AI first their mantra, obviously. Uh, Facebook is making massive investments in AI and that's really core to their business strategy mm -hmm. and, and, and operations. Um, but there's also just, you know, a pre-Cambrian explosion of um, smaller companies out there trying interesting things, um, including, including many in Australia. What, what are some of the interesting smaller companies that you see globally or, or locally? There's a, um, uh, we're an investor, uh, but a company called Zooks, which is founded by a, a Melbourne uh, uh, CEO who's now living in, in California, but the company is Zooks and it's a, uh, uh, reinventing the car from the ground up, so redesigning it um, to be more of a living room on wheels than a uh, something with a driver and a steering wheel and so on. And again, like an Uber-like service where you pull out your phone, you hail a Zooks, it takes you to your next um, destination and you, you pay for it one trip at a time. You don't buy a car um, uh, as such. I think it's in incredibly interesting startup. Um, uh, you know, obviously Google with its own self-driving car effort and then GM uh, acquired a startup called Cruise. You know, those are the three um, uh, credible players in the self-driving car market. Um, and then I think, you know, some of the breakthroughs in diagnosing medical imaging, um, there are a mm -hmm. bunch of early stage startups that have each taken a sort of domain of healthcare, whether it's a particular type of cancer or a particular type of disease and using um, AI to uh, determine, again, uh, really early on whether someone will have something, uh, not even uh, someone has, you know, uh, diagnosing that they have it, that they will have it in a, in a, in a short period of time. Um, so I think those are uh, the two areas for me. That Fascinating. So. You mentioned you mentioned Google before. It's um, everyone talks about the AlphaGo example, where they, the uh, the computer beat the uh, Lisi Doll, who was the the world's 
um, world champion Go player. But just recently, they, they had an AlphaGo Zero. Have you heard about this, this, uh, this attempt? And they, they didn't give it any of the human examples. So typically, you start off with, uh, with a whole lot of examples of, of how um, humans play, whether it's, whether it's Go or chess or whatever example you're doing. And then you, you try and train it on that, and then you get it to play itself to become better than humans. In this example, they actually started with, with nothing. They just gave it the rules of the game. In three days, it beat all of the other AlphaGo previous versions. And in 40 days, it had developed all of these um, strategies that had taken 30,000 years for, <laughs> 3,000 years rather, for, for lots of people to, to come up with how, how to actually play this game. And uh, it's quite, quite incredible. We've gone from being um, creating, sort of having to train these on, on lots of data to allowing the computer almost to train itself. Yeah, I remember Gary. Gary Kasparov said, when he was asked, how would you prepare for a game against uh, Deep Blue? He said, I'd bring a hammer. <laughs> and uh, and, yeah, and, and that, was, that was 20 years ago. I think today, probably yeah. a hammer wouldn't even do it. And I think the, the other incredible thing to, um, to think about is AI benefits from all the other AIs before it. So you know, you normally, um, you learn how to drive your car. Um, you teach your son or daughter how to drive the car. They're starting from scratch, um, and you're trying to pass on your knowledge versus um, you know, that uh, AlphaGo algorithm, um, having all of the experience of those uh, mm -hmm. such that the next um, uh, algorithm that's playing uh, a game of Go benefits from all of the knowledge that comes before. It's just yes. flawlessly passed on to the next iteration of it. And um, instead of learning uh, as one driver in the self-driving car world, you learn from millions before you who have driven. Mm -hmm. um, and so that networked cumulative aspect of it is um, also very hard to fathom and, and is very easy to underestimate. Yeah. I think that'll be really powerful in the, it's already becoming really powerful in the, in the call center space. Um, you know, there's an Australian company, Digital Workforce, um, that uh, worked on the development of uh, Nadia, which was the um, uh, digital call center interface for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, and learns over time uh, in a way that no individual call centre operator could learn despite you know, months, years of training um, to answer every possible question, um, to uh, respond to the voice and facial stimulus of the person that they're interacting with, to express more empathy, um, recognise the emotion in the, in the person's voice and have this you know, uh, unlimited bank of knowledge to answer every every question. So I think you know, that that space of learning will be really powerful in terms of the interactions with humans as well as um, as problem solving. Are there any listed Australian companies that you think are doing a particularly good job in this space? Um, look, I think uh, Australia has generally been quite a long way behind the eight ball on some of these technologies, particularly um, particularly among the amongst the larger companies. Um, AI more, more broadly defined as AI and automation, about 9% of Australian listed companies uh, exhibit characteristics of engaging in uh, automation and AI. That's about half some of our global peers. Um, you, you know, we, we do have some, um, Australia's traditional strength industries tend not to be the digital industries. They, we tend to have comparative advantage in you know, mining, energy, agriculture. And those have been the industries which have traditionally been a bit slower to adopt these types of technologies, but I actually think that's going to flip. Um, and we're going to see uh, a, a very rapid rate of change in those traditional industries as they adopt mm -hmm. uh, technologies, you know, autonomous trucks, sensing, all those types of um, technologies which will transform traditionally old industries uh, and really improve their competitiveness rapidly. So, so you talked about trucks, autonomous trucks, 12% um, of the world's workforce is engaged in transport or logistics of some kind. Yeah. Do you have a view, I think you do have a view of uh, whether it's going to change, uh, how it's going to change employment. So is it going to destroy or create more jobs in the future? These are, these are big numbers and you know, a million people driving vehicles um, sounds like a lot and, and is a lot. Um, but you know, there are uh, millions of jobs created every year. Um, and if you think about the time frame by which that gets, that, that gets implemented, it's a, it's a large number, but it's by no means an overwhelming number compared to the dynamism of the economy and the number of jobs that are created every year. Um, look, 
I think if it, it depends a bit how you define a job. If you go like the work as it is today in 2017 is what we're going to call a job, then yes, there are going to be a lot fewer people doing those activities. If you're willing to have a bit more of an expansive view about what a job is and think about jobs that you know, might exist in 30 years time but don't exist today and certainly weren't even contemplated 30 years ago, then I think humans are pretty good at developing new tasks for ourselves. Um, and every wave of, of change has generated um, some displacement and ultimately humans have found new ways to create jobs and employment. Is this time different? Um, uh, I think it has different characteristics but I think the fundamental ability of humans to find ways to deliver value to each other mm -hmm. uh, is not going away. So Elon Musk says, well, you know, robots and computers are going to be better than us at everything. What, what happens then? I just don't agree with that. I think um, uh, there'll be lots of things that robots and computers are better than us at, but you know, we have a comparative advantage in one fundamental thing, and that's being human. Mm -hmm. And I think we're always going to value that. And the expression of that through a job might change a lot. Uh, there'll probably be a lot less people doing routine tasks, a lot less people doing physical tasks, and a lot more people climbing up Maslow's pyramid, delivering the types of tasks and services um, that make us human. And you know, that's, that's something that we're well equipped to do for a long period of time. I think it's also uh, you know, a false choice between human and machine. And I think you know, throughout history, it's the human enhanced by the machine that has always won that uh, equation. And so, um, you know, I think it sort of pits it against this Hollywood movie of machine versus human when in reality, uh, uh, people uh, uh, are made smarter and amplify their output through the use of a machine or a computer. And so I think, you know, if history is any guide, that's just gonna happen more so in the future, um, uh, you know, with AI. The other thing is, um, you know, everyone used to work on a farm, uh, then everyone used to work in a factory. And, you know, again, it's um, gut-wrenching in the short term of, you know, mm. someone uh, uh, losing their job or having to uh, retrain and find another area to um, uh, use their time with. But, um, you know, over a longer period, I think it's just so inevitable that um, people find more and more useful um, tasks of their time when they don't have to do the base level tasks. So. So the speed of the transition obviously matters a lot here. Um, if it goes, if it happens very quickly, then then we're all more at risk. Which which jobs do you think are most at risk in the in the shorter term, Andrew? Um, well, in, in any job that is constitu that is composed of tasks that um, are able to be automated, and the tasks that are most able to be automated are the routine tasks and the manual tasks. Um, and so, you know, there are a bunch of jobs that are clearly at, at risk because they contain a lot of those tasks. However, you know, the important thing to say here is um, there is no evidence right now of a big acceleration in the rate at which automation and artificial intelligence is killing jobs. Uh, you know, this year, uh, about 0.5% of all jobs will be lost to uh, automation and productivity enhancing machines more broadly. That is no higher than it was in the yeah. 60s uh, when tens of thousands of jobs were being lost in agriculture from the um, tractors and other farm machinery displacing uh, labourers in agriculture. It is no higher than it was in the 80s and 90s when, uh, when uh, machines were displacing labour in factories um, around the country. Um, and uh, you know, you only have to look at the productivity statistics to see why that's true. You know, we do not have, we've got globally and in Australia relatively low productivity growth, and that is not evidence of a huge wave of machines displacing, um, displacing humans. So look, if we're headed for some hockey stick change where this accelerates really rapidly, mm -hmm. that's possible, but there's definitely no evidence of it right now. There's a lot of discussion about which industries will be disrupted and which, which companies, but Maybe flip it around for you, Nikki. You, you invest in companies. You've got to look at from which ones are the easiest for you to disrupt, or where, where are you putting your, your money right now? I think uh, more broadly, it's robotics. I, I think the most interesting example of that is autonomous vehicles. So the, the, mm -hmm. the taxi, or the I think it's, it looks like the taxi industry, but is actually the um, people owning a car or just you know pressing a button paying for a ride in a car, um, I think that, that will have the, the biggest near-term uh, impact. 
any kind of uh, robot that needs to interact with sort of unsafe areas in factories, uh, the, uh, automating a warehouse, uh, automating particularly uh, logistics and so on, uh, um, all of these areas are sort of ripe uh, for this technology to be, uh, you know, so cheap and so affordable that, you know, um, it's ready to be adopted sort of in the next 12 to 24 months. So now we might just go through some, some winners and losers in the Australian share market. Um, just sort of caveat first that obviously this is, this is a long time coming, so, so this is going to take a long time to play out, so this is probably not a, not a call in the short term for, for any of these companies, but just interested in your perspectives on, on whether they'll be beneficiaries or, uh, or, or losers from, from artificial intelligence generally. Let's start with Telstra, Nikki. Telstra. Uh, I think Telstra, again, has this wonderful opportunity ahead of it. Um, uh, however, if it doesn't embrace something, if uh, by default it does nothing, um, it will be deeply negatively affected. I think, um, you know, in the short term, uh, I wouldn't be too worried. I think businesses that hug regulation and are more tightly regulated tend to uh, survive uh, and not be affected um, by technology change as early as those unregulated uh, industries. So. Um, so has an opportunity. Uh, hopefully, you know, I'd be optimistic. I'm a forever optimist that they would take some of that opportunity. Um, but obviously, if they do nothing, then um, um, it won't end well. Andrew, quickly, winner or loser for Telstra? Yeah, look, I think lots of upside if they there to take they it. They made a choice. Mm. BHP. Oh, the clear winner. I think. I mean, um, uh, lots of scope. Uh, to really transform um, the mining industry. Um, BHP doing a good job, um, close to the forefront of the technological changes in, in that industry and pretty ambitious plans to go much further. Winner or loser, BHP? Yeah, I think winner, I think, you know, obviously uh, the opportunity to make uh, uh, their operations uh, so much more efficient um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the, the ownership of the, uh, the rights and, um, the uh, scale of their production and the barriers to entry, it's, uh, you know, they're in a nice position. And you talked a lot earlier about deflation in healthcare. How about health scope? I wouldn't be able to comment uh, specifically because I don't know too much about um, health scope, but I would say uh, all healthcare companies are in danger of, you know, great change. I think um, you can't rely on the government debugging the bad incentives in the healthcare system, mm -hmm. you just almost have to make it free so that it eliminates all of that. And so this kind of bottom up free alternative to an existing system, not um, tweaking an existing system, but creating a bottom up almost free system um, uh, that can exist. And I think uh, all levels of healthcare, um, you know, are in danger of that. Healthscope, winner or loser? I think it's a competitive, um very competitive sector and I think a lot of water to go under the bridge in this sector as to how this plays out. Um, but yeah, again, lots of opportunity and up to them to seize it. Okay. And another business that you know a fair bit about, um, given where you used to work at West Farmers, um, Woolworths? Look, I think the retailers have a huge amount to gain. Um, uh, you know, targeted marketing, the use of their uh, loyalty programs. Uh, there is a massive amount of data to completely change the shopping experience and the interactions um, but, uh, with the consumer. Um, the, the question is, uh, can they get up the curve fast enough and do they have enough data to compete with um, some of the uh, incoming players, including, including Amazon, but not limited to, to Amazon. Um, and there's a real opportunity for uh, the Australian firms, I think, to have a bit of a battle with Amazon using their much larger uh, Australian data set um, and that could be a real source of competitive advantage. But remember on the flip side, Amazon's got a pretty awesome competitive advantage in, in the data that they have on the product side. Um, so I think we're about to see a little war play out between two different sources of data um, dueling against each other. Interesting. CBA. CBA, I think uh, its fate will be entirely uh, tied to everything that's not technology. It's you know obviously an all-in bet on the Australian housing market, so I think how that plays out it may go positively, it may go negatively, but I think technology is such a um, a small um, uh, you know impact on it. Um, its fate is already locked into whether Australian housing uh, does well or badly. Interesting. 
Look, I think CBA is certainly using data really mm -hmm. well and right at the forefront of the banking uh, industry and trying to use that data to support their customers and deliver services um, uh, to their customers above credit. Um, and I think that's got the potential to be a real competitive advantage for them. Excellent. And so of the 9% that you mentioned that are you know, using automation and the like, do these, these five companies sit in that, the, the good 9% or the other <laughs> well, 91%? Look, look, overall, the, as Australia under-indexes in most industries. Um, uh, the industry where we do best um, in this field relative to others is in uh, mining and energy. Uh, and um, that, that's where I think Australia has some uh, is at the forefront of the application of these technologies within um, uh, within industries, um, and that's a good thing because they're issues uh, areas of real strength for Australia and always have been. Excellent, Nikki, Andrew, thank you very much for for joining us today.